Welcome back to the Harbour Box News Corner. Fairly sizable week for news, so much so that we decided to split out a section on AMD's 20.2.2 driver update into its own video, which we published on the channel yesterday. Well worth a watch if you're interested in how AMD is fixing the issues with their Radeon drivers and whether problem-plagued Navi owners are seeing any improvements. And we're going to kick this news corner off with another AMD story because they've just held their financial analyst day and talked about a few interesting things that's worth covering here. No actual product announcements. AMD never announced products at these sort of analyst events, but they did go into detail on product roadmaps and some of the technologies that they've been working on. Let's start with RDNA 2, which is the big topic on everyone's mind right now with all the incessant and, yeah, often inaccurate big Navi rumors. AMD has already said that new high-performance GPU products will launch in 2020, and today's event didn't provide a lot of clarity on when that would happen specifically. However, AMD did mention that RDNA 2 GPUs, and it's pretty clear at this point that any big Navi design will be using RDNA 2, are set to launch by the end of the year. Normally when a company makes broad statements like coming by the end of the year, the product in question is still some time away. I know a lot of people are hoping these GPUs are just a couple of months away, but everything AMD is saying and everything we're hearing in the industry is pointing to RDNA 2 being a fair way away. Second half of the year sort of time frame, if not as late as the fourth quarter. But AMD is willing to share some details on what RDNA 2 is bringing to the table. The huge announcement from today is that AMD delivering a 50% performance per watt improvement with RDNA 2, which is yeah, much higher than I think a lot of people were expecting. This isn't just a small revision to RDNA, this is a full-blown overhaul that is set to make AMD much more competitive in the efficiency game. Now, this isn't an indication that AMD GPUs will be 50% faster, just 50% more efficient, but that should allow them to compete much more strongly with NVIDIA. Navi as it stands right now delivers similar efficiency to NVIDIA's Turing GPUs, despite Navi being a generation ahead on process at 7 nanometers versus 12 nanometers. A 50% performance per watt increase would bring AMD to where they would like to be, I think, on 7 nanometer, and that should make RDNA 2 much more able to compete with NVIDIA's next generation that's also expected to jump down to 7 nanometer for the first time. AMD says these efficiency gains come from several areas, improved IPC, logic enhancements, and physical optimizations. Their GPU roadmap still lists RDNA 2, which will be used with Navi 2X GPUs, so interesting name choice there. That will be a 7 nanometer design. However, our understanding is that this isn't exactly the same node AMD is already using for Navi, but a process enhancement. Whether that's TSMC's N7 Plus, aka 7 nanometer plus, or whether it's their refined N7P process, remains unclear. However, there should be some gains from that sort of update to the process tech. As you'll see, the roadmap also shows RDNA 3 for Navi 3X GPUs sometime in 2021 on an advanced node. Nothing else to share on that front. But moving back to RDNA 2 for a second, AMD also re-announced several things we pretty much already knew at this point, including hardware level ray tracing, variable rate shading, and top of stack GPUs. So with this next generation of GPUs from AMD, thanks to those performance per watt gains and other architectural improvements, AMD should have a very solid lineup that includes those extreme performance products that they've been missing for generations now. AMD also took the time to announce an entirely new GPU architecture designed for server and data center markets called cDNA. This is essentially mirroring what NVIDIA offers with two different architectures for different markets. They have Volta for data centers and Turing for gaming, plus a few workstation and server applications thrown in. And now AMD will have something similar with cDNA and rDNA. cDNA is a compute-focused architecture with enhancements like machine learning and tensor op acceleration with less of a focus on graphic stuff. It's set to come out this year with 7 nanometer products, again with a successor called cDNA2 expected in 2021 on an advanced node. Let's blaze through the rest of AMD's announcements. On CPUs, not a whole lot to share here outside some roadmaps. They have Zen 3 still on track for 2020 as fourth gen Ryzen, although it's expected late in the year, again using a process enhanced 7 nanometer. The consumer roadmap doesn't go beyond Zen 3. However, the server roadmap does, placing Zen 4 in 2021 on 5 nanometer. 
AMD also talked about packaging improvements they're working on, including X3D packaging, which, as you can see, is a bit of a hybrid 2.5D, 3D approach featuring stacked chiplets and or memory. No confirmed date on this one other than it's a future technology promising to bring a 10 times increase in bandwidth density. There was also some talk about future versions of the Infinity Fabric, which is being updated to now being called the Infinity Architecture. The next generation of this technology will allow CPU to GPU connections to move beyond PCIe to a fully coherent connectivity architecture based on, of course, the Infinity Architecture, unifying memory access and improving bandwidth and latency. It sounds like this is mostly for server markets, but it is still pretty cool that the Infinity Fabric is going beyond just CPU to CPU connections or GPU to GPU and actually providing that CPU to GPU link. Third gen Infinity architecture is expected to debut with Zen 4 Epic processors, so probably 2021, 2022 for that. AMD also spent a lot of time detailing their financial results. I'm not going to talk about that stuff because I find it pretty boring, but it's safe to say AMD has turned around their financials in the last few years on the back of Zen. Other than that, some pretty cool things to look for in the future, especially in the later parts of this year where we should be seeing major CPU and GPU releases. I know a lot of people would have wanted yeah, that big Navi design to be coming much sooner, but second half of the year is probably going to be a pretty bumper crop from a lot of different companies. In other news now, Intel's CFO, George Davis, has admitted that their 10 nanometer manufacturing node isn't great. And Antec has a fantastic transcription of his comments at Morgan Stanley's analyst conference. And there's a few key quotes here that are worth highlighting. When comparing 10 nanometer to some of Intel's past nodes like 14 nanometer and 22 nanometer, this is what Davis had to say. Look, this just isn't going to be the best node that Intel has ever had. It's going to be less productive than 14 nanometer, less productive than 22 nanometer. The fact is, like I said, it isn't going to be as strong a node as people would expect from 14 nanometer or what they'll see in 7 nanometer. Davis followed this up later with some other comments on 10 nanometer performance, saying that the effect of 10 nanometer in 2021 is just it's sort of built today because you've got to get through that product cycle and the node. We're excited about the products, but you know, the node isn't going to be quite the performer that historically we've had. I think this is a pretty honest assessment of Intel's 10 nanometer as it stands right now. It definitely doesn't look to be delivering the performance they were able to achieve on previous nodes, hence why Intel's entire high performance lineup remains on 14 nanometer through the 10th generation. In the past, Intel has mostly dodged around the issues they've been having with 10 nanometer, consistently calling it on track over the years when it kind of wasn't and boasting about how it's doing with low power parts. But internally, it's clear that Intel aren't expecting great things from 10 nanometer. For the future, Davis expects that Intel will return to process parity in the 7 nanometer generation and regain the lead in the 5 nanometer generation. Now, Intel are referring here to their naming scheme. So compared to TSMC, for example, Intel expect to return to parity with their 7 nanometer up against TSMC 5 nanometer, which is set to pack similar transistor densities, and products using either tech should be arriving around 2021. As for the 5 nanometer generation, as Intel calls it, well, that's still many years down the track. So Intel doesn't expect to have foundry leadership for probably the next three to four years at the very least. Davis has also hinted there would be more of an overlap between generations than we've seen before, which fits with the stuff we've seen from Intel previously, like backporting. Based on these comments, it's interesting times ahead for Intel. They're in a position now where they're facing probably two to three years of being clearly behind on process tech as TSMC 7 nanometer dominates. And then with the next generation, several more years of parity in the best case if Intel live up to their own estimations. This is giving AMD a decent head start and should lead to a fiercely competitive market in the years to come that isn't dictated by one company's exclusive dominant foundry. So yeah, I'm pretty excited to see where the CPU market goes. AMD are preparing to launch a new graphics card in their Polaris lineup called the Radeon RX 590 GME, and it seems destined exclusively for China. According to EXP Review, four board partner RX 590 GME cards have appeared at Chinese retailer JD.com, all under a pre-order period with an official release set for March 9th. The cards in question are from XFX, ASRock, Sapphire, and PowerColor, so all the usual big names in the AMD OEM space. The RX 590 GME it's a bit of an interesting one. It retains the 2,304 stream processes of the standard RX 590 and RX 580, 
but brings clock speeds down closer to the RX 580. The 590 normally comes with a boost clock of 1545 MHz with OEMs often factory overclocking the card further. The RX 590 GME has clock speeds ranging from 1380 to 1560 MHz depending on the model, which is around a 150 MHz lower clock speed on average compared to the non-GME variants. Meanwhile, the RX 580 sits with a standard boost clock of 1340 MHz, again all with the same 2304 cores. Same memory configuration, 8GB of GDDR5, and mostly the same cooler designs from these OEMs as well. Basically, this is just AMD offering RX 580-like performance with the name RX 590 on the box. Yes, there will be small GME text on there too, but it's disappointing to once again have these sorts of confusing products on the market. Two different names, similar sort of performance. I really don't like seeing this sort of thing. Luckily though, Pricing doesn't appear to be too bad for the RX 590 GME. The XFX model, for example, is currently on JD.com for 1200 yuan, the same price as the now out of stock RX 580 model from them that uses the same cooler. Meanwhile, the actual RX 590 is about 100 yuan more expensive. Similar story with the Sapphire model I checked. Now, for reference, 1200 yuan is about 170 US dollars, which puts these prices in line with what we see for the RX 580 and RX 590 on Newegg. What's likely going on here is this RX 590 GME is using AMD's 12 nanometer Polaris revision, but for binning reasons or whatever is being clocked back down to RX 580 levels, a card that normally uses a 14 nanometer GPU. This hasn't been confirmed or anything, but it would make the most sense as a way to make use of extra 12 nanometer capacity. We've seen something similar with Ryzen CPUs lately with something like the 1600 AF. What's not obvious though, is why this is called the RX 590 GME instead of the RX 580 GME. The latter would make a lot more sense given this is RX 580-like performance, but they've chosen to use uh, the RX 590 name, which, yep, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of. In the never-ending saga of Intel 10th Gen Comet Lake S CPU leaks, this week we have supposed photos of the CPUs themselves. Not that this tells us a lot about the CPUs or how they perform, but it does indicate that we are continuing to inch closer to an official release, which we expect will happen in April. The photos, which are, yeah, pretty bad, partly blurred anyway, do show Intel confidential branding, indicating they are engineering samples. But on the rear of the chip, we do see a different array of pads showing off the LGA1200 package that these chips will use. To make it a bit clearer, here's the 10th gen parts up against the underside of 9th gen CPUs, which use LGA1151. So definitely a different CPU here, and we can expect a lot more about this yeah, pretty shortly. And now in buying news, us Australians finally have a place where we can buy the Ryzen 5 1600 AF, and that's PC case gear. Right now, they have the only stock and only shipments of the 1600 AF in the country, selling it for 150 Aussie dollars, which is $50 cheaper than the Ryzen 5 2600. As a reminder, the 1600 AF is basically a 2600 in terms of its performance, so it's a great choice for budget system builders, and hopefully it remains in stock for a while to come. And finally, in very important news, Noctua's famous hoodies are now available to buy. The diehard fans of Hardware Unboxed will remember Steve raving about these when we got them at Computex last year. I think he wears his literally all the time. It's a really comfortable and warm hoodie, so yeah, normally we wouldn't cover this, but I thought I'd throw this section in here specifically for Steve so that he can load up on a few more hoodies. I know he watches, I hope, the whole of these episodes, so this section's for you, Steve. Next thing we know, he'll have pretty much just a, think, an entire wardrobe of Noctua hoodies and hardware unboxed merch, and that's what will be going around with. Maybe we need to make some hardware unboxed pants so then we can really complete Steve's wardrobe for him. Anyway, that's it for this episode of the Hardware Unboxed News Corner. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. You'll get these segments in your inbox every Friday. Hit the bell icon so you don't miss out. Follow us on all the places, Twitter, Facebook. Check out our Patreon page as well and our merch store. Both of those things, uh, there's links to those in the description below. I'll catch you in the next one.